Welcome to Unsafe Space. We have only two rules here. Number one, feelings are not arguments. Number two, no hitting. I'm your host, Carter Laren. Now, I'm tired of this Kavanaugh stuff. I've got to take a break of it. I'm sure from it, I'm sure we'll come back to Kavanaugh stuff uh, later. There's a lot going on this week. But um, I wanted to talk about something else. I wanted to talk about what happened recently at uh, CERN, which is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Um, they basically, they build particle accelerators, lots of smart people. They're probably most widely known f uh, in the general population for having invented the World Wide Web, the protocol underneath it. So Alexander, Dr. Alexander Strumi, uh, Alessandro, sorry, Dr. Alessandro Strumia, who is a theoretical physicist, was, uh, was recently suspended uh, over a presentation that he gave. He's a theoretical physicist at CERN, and he was recently suspended over a pres presentation he, he gave. And that presentation was analyzing the claim that um, the, the STEM community, so science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, specifically his community, the physics community, but the science community generally, uh, was biased against women. And he didn't think that this was necessarily true, and so he wanted to analyze that claim. And you know, obviously, this is a standard claim. We hear this narrative all the time about how uh, the STEM fields are biased against women. So uh, he did a fairly technical analysis of the claim, and he made uh, some slides and gave a presentation. Uh, the presentation itself isn't available online, but the slides are. And I went through them, and he, you know, he makes a compelling case, uh, cites data for for his his claim, and um, you know, he includes some lighthearted, non-technical slides. But for for the most part, it's or a lot of it is kind of meaty and too technical for a lot of people. So, uh, you know, if you're afraid of of Greek letters or um, you know determinants or mathematical things like that. Uh, you may be a little bit intimidated by his slides. But, you know, I have a technical background, so I thought I'd go through the slides and just kind of present them in layman's terms because, it's, you know, none of us were really there to hear his presentation, but the slides are available. I'll link to the slides below. So I'll, I'm will i going to go through the slides and I'll present them in, in layman's terms as best I can. You can draw your own conclusions about what he was saying, whether he deserves to be suspended, um, anything. So, uh, of course, the one thing CERN doesn't want you to do, I'm sure, is to draw your own conclusions. So let's start with uh, slide one here. Now, slide one, he basically says, look, um, there's this what he calls asymmetry uh, in terms of the representation between males and females in, in science uh, as measured against the general population. So the general population, roughly 50-50, not true in physics uh, and other sciences. And so he says, look, the, the big question here is, is why this is. And, and he says there are two possibilities here. One he calls the mainstream theory. And that is basically the theory that men and, and women are equivalent uh, in every way. And therefore, the result of any gender imbalance in physics or any other science is purely the result of discrimination. And he, again, he calls that the mainstream theory. And then he says, well, there's this other conservative theory. And he says the conservative theory is, is basically that um, this gender difference in, in science is inherent because men and women actually aren't equivalent to one another. And... Uh, this is kind of an inherent property, right? So this is like saying, well, um, you know, there's uh, tall people on basketball teams, right? Well, it, is it that tall people are better at basketball? Or is there some kind of bias against short people, right? Um, maybe that's a, um, a more obvious example, but he's he's making the case, hey, there's this other theory where maybe there's a difference, and that accounts for this, and it's not discrimination. So what he says he's going to do here is he's going to examine uh, bibliometric data, which basically means he's going to do a, a statistical analysis of written publications, papers that people have, have written, scientists have written, citations they've made, and he's going to use that body of literature to 
um, try and get some data about which one of these theories is more supported by the evidence. So obviously to start off, the guy's in trouble right away because he's questioning the narrative that there's uh, misogyny and, and discrimination. That's, that's the cause for this. So let's go to slide two. He, slide two, he explains, hey, this is what the mainstream theory is. And he gives an overview. And um, he, he specifically mentions, mentions um, gender conferences. Uh, but he quotes some people. He says, and some of these quotes are, um, all women share the same kind of sad and unfair experiences since the beginning of their scientific career. Mansplaining, gaslighting, white male hetero privilege, sexual harassment at epidemic levels, microaggressions. Um, men mobilize their masculinity supporting men in ways that advance careers, right? And he's saying when people say, people say to him, don't you see you have an unconscious bias and you steal credit um, away from women and give it to men. Uh, and the evaluators tend to favor men. And, um, and actually people going so far as to saying scientific equality is a gender social construction. So uh, <clears throat> imagine them making your next life-saving drug. Uh, he quotes, some more excellence is the current buzzword. Gender equality should achieve the same. So basically they're saying like excellent is, is just kind of a way to mask bias. Um, and then this one person, I have a dream that excellence in science is no more distorted and sweltered by gender stereotypes or creeping dis discrimination. All right. So lots of stuff about discrimination. So he's basically making the, the argument that this is the mainstream theory. And he's right. This is the mainstream theory. And I don't think uh, people would, would really dispute that. So, so that's the next slide. So the next slide, he, he describes what he calls the conservative theory. And he basically has three, three major points here. Um, and the first, the, the, the second point actually has two sub sub points, which are really the crux of this. But the first point he makes is, look, physics is open to everyone. He says anyone from any nation, sex, background, age, anyone's allowed to come into physics and do this. Okay. Um, and he calls it a community of interest. So if they're interested, they can do it. Right. And so, um, and he even makes a point that says, look, when physics, physics was more international, even when, um, when there's a lot of cultured nationalism, physics has, has always kind of um, traditionally crossed borders and physicists have collaborated across national borders. So he's arguing that the culture is pretty open. Um, the second point he makes is that, look, physics is very hard um, and it's a specific, uh, particular discipline. And there are two things you really need to, to be in and succeed at physics. Um, and the first one he says is interest. And he's saying maybe one in every 10 people are interested in physics. Now, he's a physicist. I think he's uh, overestimating the percentage of people that are interested in physics. Uh, but one out of every number of people are interested in physics. So not everyone is interested. That's his first point. And the second point he's making is that there's a high ability required because it's a very difficult, uh, difficult discipline. And so his estimate, he's just putting a question mark here, so he's not claiming this is accurate, but one person in every 1,000, as he says. So you need, both, um, you need both the interest and the ability in order to be a physicist. And, and um, so that's, that's point number two, is that you need both interest and ability, and, and I think that's really the crux of it. And then his third point is, um, you know, physics requires kind of um, very tough rules. You have to be intellectually honest, lots of quantitative evidence. It's not easy. Um, and his point here is really, look, if you don't like those rules, you may not choose, you may not choose physics because it's, it's pretty rigorous. So, so this is his overview of the conservative theory. So he's given his two overviews of the theory. Um, and then on the next slide, he says, okay, look, both of these theories may make us feel uncomfortable. He calls them both uh, unpleasant. They have unpleasant implications. But he basically says, look, you know, we wouldn't need to examine this except for that we're being attacked. The physics community and the science community is being attacked as being unbiased and discriminatory. So even though both of these theories are unpleasant, we really now have to dig in and figure out which one it is because, um, because we're being attacked as being discriminatory. And making policy and funding decisions based on this assumption that there's gender bias. So 
what he does is, and this is kind of a a, a standard um, method for for going th- um, for evaluating different hypotheses scientifically. He says, "Well, look, let's imagine what would we predict was true if the main th- what would be the result if the mainstream theory was true. So if that's true, what would we expect to see in the data?" And then he says, "Well, in, if the conservative theory were true, what would we expect to see in that data?" So. With respect to the mainstream theory, he he has three basic points. He says, well, if that were true, we would see discrimination in measurable things like uh, conference speaking uh, slots and paper citations and hirings and that kind of thing. Okay, that's true. If that was true, we would see those differences. Um, Number two, he says, well, if there's this bias, if there's this discrimination against uh, females, we would expect we would expect that the cultures around the world that have more gender equality would actually have more women in the STEM fields, right? Because as we kind of eliminated this bias, that would open up the STEM fields for women, and they would have uh, higher representation in STEM fields, as opposed to cultures where there was more uh, more gender inequality, where women would be kept out of these fields. And the last thing he says that we would expect if, uh, if this mainstream gender discrimination theory is true is that when you get closer to power, when you look at positions that people hold, when you get closer to power, right, merit-based positions are kind of more subjective. So the higher up you go in you know, management or politics or whatever, they're, they're hiring and firing is more subjective. And so he would said, you know, if, if there was this anti-female bias, in the more powerful positions, we would see fewer females, right? And then in the less powerful positions where it's a lot more objective, right? Are you doing a good job in the lab, right? It would be harder to implement that bias. And so we would see less bias in the less powerful positions and more bias in the more powerful positions. So that's what he says we would see if there was, uh, if this mainstream gender discrimination theory was true. And then he says, okay, well, what would we expect if the conservative theory is true? And remember, his conservative theory right now is uh, there's other reasons that aren't discrimination, right? Ability, interest, who knows what, there's other reasons. Well, he says we'd expect to see if this if that theory were true would expect to see um, kind of this non-standard distribution of interest and ability. So would would expect that maybe men are more interested and or more naturally able to do physics as a whole, right? So would see a bias in the statistics that way, and um, and so so that would be one of the reasons that we would expect this like either men are more interested or more able. And, or both, and and it would skew the distribution that direction. That's what we would expect to see. And the other thing he says we'd expect to see is if there were if there were bias, um, communities that have smarter people would actually have less bias because smarter people are more immune to implicit bias and um, non rational decision making. Okay, so. His, his argument is that the smarter communities you'd see less, that maybe the, the communities where uh, they're not as intellectual, maybe don't have a firm grasp of things like uh, the scientific method and objective reasoning, they maybe would be more subject to bias, so you would see even more bias in those fields. So those are the predictions. So, so that's how he starts out, and now he's going to look at some data. So on the next slide, slide five, he's basically outlining what data he's going to use. And he's using the High Energy Physics Literature Database, which is apparently a database of uh, a lot of literature in high energy physics. And in this database, he has access to gender data, hiring data. Um, he talks a little bit about the some uh, fractional counting methods he's going to use because sometimes there's multiple authors for papers and he wants to make sure they get fractional credit and that kind of thing. Um, so he talks about his methods, but basically... Just kind of saying, this is where I'm getting the data. It's uh, voluminous. There's a lot of data. He's he's um, he's demonstrating how much he can kind of guess at uh, sex based on 
uh, name and country, and he says he maybe only 85% coverage that way, but uh, it's enough data. It's, it's, it's plenty of data. He's talking about, you know, uh, 3 million references of papers, uh, 1 million papers, 3 million references, 70,000 authors, 7,000 institutes, lots of data here. So this is the data he's going to use. So now he begins to analyze that data. And on the next slide, slide six, he's going to look at some of these assumptions or some of these predictions, rather. <clears throat> so remember, one expectation we would have if the mainstream premise of gender discrimination in the sciences is true is we would expect fewer women in power positions, right, as compared to uh, kind of less powerful, more objective measured positions, right? And so he does a couple things here. One, he looks at various industries and he, you know, everything from education, psychology, humanities, law, business, STEM, logging, trucking, mining. He looks at these, these different communities, different industries, and he makes some observations. He says, well, look, actually, it seems like there's more women in higher power positions like law and business. They actually have more female representation right? than in the STEM fields, which are less powerful and more objective. Um, there's actually fewer women in the STEM fields. And and he continues looking and he says that there's even fewer women in ev really low power uh, positions like construction, trucking, mining, uh, positions that would be considered blue collar and low class. There's very few women. It's almost all men there. So he says, well, that, that doesn't make sense, right? Because that's the opposite of what we would expect. We would expect that at the, in the powerful positions like law right, and business, to be very skewed toward men and the more menial positions to be more, more equivalent. Uh, and STEM, certainly we would expect it to be more equivalent in things like law or business, but that's not true. And then he also looks at CERN internally. Now this is obviously where he works. So he, he cares about CERN internally and he makes, uh, he makes an observation that, Hey, at CERN, the number of female administrators, high power, the number of female administrators, the percentage of female administrators, is greater than the percentage of female physicists, which is greater than the percentage of female technicians. That's exactly backwards, right? So the conclusion here is that he's seeing the exact opposite of what we would predict if the mainstream gender discrimination model is true. Okay. So then he goes on to slide seven. Now, another expectation that we would, we, would, we would expect based on mainstream discrimination model is that we would think that communities that have more gender equality culturally uh, would have a higher percentage of women in STEM fields and fundamental theory. Fundamental theory is, is I think, his specialty. He's a uh, theoretical physicist. So he's saying we would expect higher percentage of women in those theories or in those uh, disciplines. But if you look at the chart, actually, um, the opposite is true in both of those cases. So, for example, there's a higher percentage of women in fundamental theory in Turkey than in Australia, even though Australia is much more culturally uh, gender uh, equal than, than Turkey. Again, uh, similarly with STEM, right, there's a higher percentage of women in STEM in Indonesia as compared to Belgium, right? So, again... This is more evidence, more data that the opposite of what you would expect if the mainstream discrimination theory is true, the opposite of what you would expect is what you actually see in, in the data. So then he goes on to the next slide. The next slide is, he calls it sexism in citations. Now, Another expectation we'd see here, it, remember, is, is discrimination in in things like things that are measurable, like the number of papers that are cited, the number of female authors that are cited. Now, just to give a little background here for those of uh, you who maybe haven't been around academics in a while, papers are very important in academia. They're, uh, part of your resume includes how, basically how, many, how often your paper is cited. Citations are quite important, and they can help you get jobs, um, and not, not to mention prestige. So academicians are always trying to write papers that get cited by other academicians. So 
if there's discrimination here, if if male authors are citing other male authors more than female authors disproportionately, right? If they're being biased against women, that's important because because it would mean that women therefore uh, would be suffering this kind of bias in their careers as they move forward because whenever they wrote a paper, it will be harder to get cited. So he says, okay, well, how are we going to check this? And this slide is particularly complicated. You can ignore the math. I'll explain the, the gist of this to you. But basically, he says, look, papers with multiple authors are going to kind of complicate things for this analysis. So I'm only, only going to look at papers that have single authors. So there's one gender. We know who's authoring the paper, right? And I'm going to look at papers where there's single authors, and they're citing they have multiple citations. I'm going to look at the citations that cite single author papers, right? So there's not a lot of complexity about multi-author stuff. Okay, fine. So he simplifies his, his analysis here a little bit. And basically what he's doing is he's saying, okay, I'm going to count up the number of male written papers that met reference uh, other male written papers and the number of male written papers that reference female written papers and vice versa the number of female written papers that reference male written papers and the number of female papers that reference other female written papers and so and he did this for a, a few different subfields astro astrophysics and uh you know uh experimental nuclear physics and that kind of thing and you know he goes back actually into the 70s for this here and what does he what does he see? So what would you expect? You would expect, if there's this citation bias, you'd expect that when women uh, write their papers, now remember there's a disproportionate number of men and women in the field to begin with, so you have to normalize for that. So you would expect more male papers to be cited. So the way to measure this is when a woman, for example, writes a paper, um, does she cite female authors more than when a man writes a paper, for example, right? Are men and women treating men and women differently based on their gender, right? So he does this analysis. He compares uh, all four men, men citing men, men citing women, women citing men, women citing women. He compares all of them, right? And he looks at this and he finds that there is no gender preference in citations at any time, right? So... Um, what, what he notices that, yes, men are cited more than, than women in papers, but um, they're cited equally by men and women. So women also cite men more, more uh, frequently in papers. And his conclusion here is, look, this is, this is a merit-based citation, not sexism. Right? And he did a double check here because he thought, well, let's see that this analysis would actually show if there was a bias in something. Right? And so what he did was he checked to see um, there's a theory that, that authors like to cite authors from their own countries more, right? And so he um, ran this kind of similar analysis uh, based on checking for country bias. And he found that there are actually significant asymmetry, significant bias um, for referencing authors from your country. So the method works to discover bias with respect to country, but when you apply that method to look for bias with respect to gender, you don't find any. Okay, again, that goes against the mainstream gender bias narrative. So then on slide nine, he basically, this is just an, an example. He points out a, a misleading paper uh, on the subject, or at least it was cited in a misleading way. Uh, I guess he was at a conference. The speaker claimed that uh, sexism in citations has been demonstrated by this paper. Uh, but, of course, he re actually read the paper, and, he, and the paper uh, says, quote, of course, we cannot claim that we have actually measured gender bias. So, um, again, it's, uh, this is just him pointing out that people are um, misleading other people, even in citing specific papers and studies, just to fit the mainstream narrative. So then we get to slide 10. So we already looked at paper citations. Remember, we see, okay, there's not a bias there. What about speaking slots at conferences, right? So mainstream, the mainstream discrimination theory predicts that uh, we would see a measurable difference here, right? Men would be getting conference speaking slots more than women, disproportionately more. But he does this study, and he looks at the positions uh, on, the, on the list for speaking engagements uh, relative to their paper citations. And what does it turn out? Well... Uh, the number of citations correlates to whether or not you get a speaking slot, 
not your gender. And, and you look at the graph for both male and female, it's the same trajectory. They both follow the same correlation, right? So again, this runs counter to the mainstream discrimination narrative. So then he moves on to slide 11. Now, this graph uh, may be a little bit confusing, so um, I won't get into too many of the details, but what you're seeing, if you're watching this, what you're seeing here is um, a graph of the number of times male authors are cited versus the number of times uh, female authors are cited. And th this is a graph of distribution, so there's two kind of bell curve looking distributions here. Um, and obviously some people are cited more than other people, and some people cited less than other people. So now he's already shown here that there's not citation discrimination. So the point of showing this graph is, is not to, to argue about citation discrimination, it's to show that even though the averages here are similar, there's a, there's a difference in the shape of these graphs. And we'll come back to this idea later when we talk about, um, uh, when we talk about more broadly uh, abilities. <clears throat> but uh, if you see the distribution here, you'll notice that um, the distribution of female citations is much, uh, much narrower. So this is what we would say is it has a uh, smaller variance, right? <clears throat> and it's much narrower and higher. So basically it means there's more women right clumped around the middle. So fewer dumb women, fewer super smart women, more women clumped around the middle. And we're saying dumb and smart, this is really in paper citations. So few women with few citations, few women with lots of citations, lots of women with average citations right around in the middle. Um, in the men, you see that there's fewer men at the, um, at the average with the average number of citations. But um, if you look particularly at the, uh, the high-end tail, so this is way out to the right, um, the high-end tail of this graph is fatter. So I, I want to describe, I want to kind of explain what this, what this really means. Um, and and this, isn't a, this isn't an evidence of discrimination. This is an explanation based on math of why you might see more male authors, uh, sorry, more, when, you, when you're looking at the population of only people with lots of citations, you're going to see a lot more males. And so um, what he's doing here is he's saying, okay, well, let's assume that we're going to look way out on this graph. Let's assume that we want um, people who are several standard deviations uh, away from the average. Because again, the average for men and women is about the same here, right? And so the way that you measure kind of the width of a graph is you, or the bell curve distribution is you measure the variance. Uh, standard deviation is basically the square root of the variance. So you, you can measure this, how many standard deviations you are away from, from the middle. So um, if you're one standard deviation away from the middle on this graph, you have um, more citations than someone who's average. If you're two standard de deviations away, you have even more. If you're three, you have even more. And it's a log scale, so it actually is going up kind of exponentially here as, as this goes. So if you're just going to take a population, if you say, I'm going to look at just the small population of, for example, uh, Nobel laureates, and I'm going to look at only the top people. Well, because the, the graph of men is more flat, right, and the tail is longer, right? even though the averages are the same, the tail is longer, way out at five, six standard deviations, you will find a much higher percentage of men than women. And that's the point of, of this slide, I think, is what he's trying to make. And another way to, to, to quickly describe this is, imagine you had one population that went to school and they got bees all the time. This is the bees population, right? And you had another population that only got A's or C's, right? If you looked at the averages, they would be identical. But if you said, I want to get the top 10 students, they'd probably be all in population number two, right? So would the bottom 10 students. They would all be in population two as well. So anyway, that's the point of this, this slide. He's kind of talking about that. Now, on slide 12, let's get back to remember we're measuring, we're trying to look for measurable differences. And remember, if the mainstream, mainstream uh, discrimination theory is true, then then we would expect to see measurable differences in paper citations, which we've talked about, conference slots, speaking slots, which we've talked about, and hiring. So let's look at hiring. We've looked at the other two already. Now, as I explained before, citations are a part of the resume, your resume if you're an uh, academic. And so when you look at hiring data, if the mainstream theory is correct, we would expect that women 
uh, had a higher bar to get jobs, right? So we would expect that they had to have, be cited more and do an even better job just to get hired because they're bi there's bias against them. That's what we would expect. But if you look at the graphs and you look at the data, it turns out that almost uniformly, uh, women are hired with way fewer citations than men, which means the opposite is true. The exact opposite is what, of, of what we'd expect is true. Women seem to be hired with fewer citations, right? Weaker resumes, so to speak, right? So this actually suggests a bias towards hiring women, not against hiring women. So that's the point of this slide. So then he goes on to slide 13. And he says, okay, well, let's look at this in, in sub-disciplines. Let's look at hiring another way. Let's look at um, kind of uh, how, how academically old um, or career-wise old these people are when they're hired. In other words, like how many years you've been out of school, right? How much work you've done, right? And he looks again and he says, okay, well, if you compare men and women, uh, and he does it in, in different categories here, um, what we see is that Actually, women are hired on the order of a year before men. So if you look at a man and a woman with the same CV, right, the same number of citations, kind of equivalent, what he's calling uh, similar bibliometrics, right? Similar number of citations and amount of work and kind of similar resumes. Think of it that way, right? And if you look at a man and a woman with similar resumes, the woman is hired about a year before the man. That certainly doesn't look like discrimination against women. In fact, it looks like the opposite. Okay, so then he goes on to slide 14. Now again, remember, um, we're going we're gonna to look at the number of citations, but now he's going to break it down uh, by country, and he's going to see how many citations men women needed versus women needed in order to get jobs, and he breaks this down by country. And if you're watching the video here, you'll see that on the right-hand column, every single country, with the exception of China, um, requires that men have way more citations than women, right? In the U.S., for example, men have to have, on average, twice as many citations as women in order to get a job. Um, in Sweden, they have to have eight times as many in order to get a job. So only in China do men need fewer citations. And actually, with China, he's got a question mark next to the hiring numbers. I don't know what that means, so maybe his data is not complete. But regardless, I mean, we've got, I don't know, a couple dozen countries here. I didn't count them, but in all cases... Um, men need to be cited more, men, men need to cite, uh, be cited more than, than women. In fact, in Russia, they need to be cited at uh, 16 times more than women. So again, this is the exact opposite, almost across the board in countries. This is the exact opposite of what mainstream discrimination theory tells us should happen or what we should see in the data. So then on slide 15, slide 15 is kind of a weird one. It has some context that, uh, you know, we don't have, it, it seems like. But it's, he, he does a case study. Now, I'm not familiar with what case he's talking about exactly, but he's clearly, I think he's clearly referencing, um, there was a presentation called String Theory Universe, which was given by two female academicians um, at the Gender Summit Conference in Brussels in 2016. And he's comparing himself to them. He's showing that, like, hey, uh, this person was hired. This other person is the commissar. Um, I have 10 times as many citations. I wasn't hired, right? So again, this is a one-off case. He probably has a personal grudge here or maybe he's using it to make a point. Um, he also quotes, he has this quote. It says, the oppressive ambient started to open. Um, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. I found the origin of the quote, which uh, it seems to be the origin of the, the quote, uh, is from, it's from the presentation called String Theory Universe, given by the two female academicians, Accommodations at the Gender Summit Conference. Um, and they, they use this phrase, the oppressive ambient started to open. I think he's just mocking the phrase uh, because I, even in context, having looked at their slides, I have no idea what the hell they mean. Um, and it's clearly kind of a, a nonsense word phrase, but whatever. Um, and then at the bottom of the slide, he kind of looks at CERN. Again, he works at CERN, so he's trying to look at CERN specifically. And the point in the table in the, in the bottom of this slide is that he's showing that men that work at CERN have uh, a larger number of citations than the women who work at CERN, right? Um, now, I'm not sure exactly why he's uh, citing this. Um, 
maybe he's claiming that the men needed to kind of work harder to get the jobs that started in the first place. I actually think he's trying to show that men at CERN at least um, tend to have more productive careers. And the reason I think he's trying to say that is uh, the next slide, which we'll get into. But um, so that's what it is. So, but regardless here, I think the overall point that he's making on this slide is that, you know, gender summits themselves are discriminatory uh, um, against men and unscientific, right? And he's possibly claiming that CERN is discriminatory against men. So let's move to slide 16. Now, slide 16 is a graph of um, citations over the course of people's career broken down by gender. So there's male and female lines on this graph. And what this graph shows is that at the beginning of their careers, um, men and women are cited with similar regularity, right? Both kind of cited, uh, cited about as much as each other. But then as time goes on, and like we're talking decades through later in their careers, the number of citations that women receive generally starts to drop precipitously. Um, now he's already, remember, he's already provided evidence to suggest that there is not discrimination in citations themselves. So I'm not exactly what sure his point is here. Maybe he's making the point that women write fewer papers. Maybe they do other stuff. Uh, maybe he's saying that they write papers of uh, lesser quality. Um, I'm not sure what his point exactly is here, but um, but you, he is showing that there is a gap that develops over time, but doesn't exist at the beginning. Uh, so then he goes on to slide 17. Now slide 17 is what gets him in trouble with the mainstream media the most, although I'm sure they don't like any of the data that he's presented uh, up until this point either. So slide 17 is titled Discrimination Against Women. And on this slide, he says, Physics invented and built by men, it's not by invitation. That's the quote that he's been uh, hammered uh, on in the media and, and vilified for. <clears throat> and then underneath, he, he mentions that uh, Mary Curie was welcomed after showing them what they can do. Mary Curie, uh, a famous female scientist um, responsible for uh, research into uh, radiation. <clears throat> so, so he's vilified. This is the quote that's like the all over BBC or wherever, that the horrible thing he said was physics invented and built by men, it's not by invitation. So without being reactionary, let's look at this quote. There's two parts to this quote. The first quote is physics invented and built by men. Is that true? Well, it's not exclusively true. Uh, in fact, he cites a counter evidence. Uh, but it's mostly true, yeah. I mean, that's the entire complaint from the mainstream discrimination theorists, right? The people arguing about discrimination, their whole complaint is that physics is is men, right? And certainly I think you look historically of, yes, it was built, uh, built by men. It was invented and built by men to uh, not entirely, but almost entirely, right? And he's not saying that there's a reason for this, right? It could be that there are and, and there was more institutionalized sexism in the past, right? So you're not saying what the reason is, but historically, that's the way it, it, it's it been, right? Um, and then certainly if you look back, you know, look back a few hundred years ago when some of the foundations for modern science were being laid, right? it was men, right? Probably largely because women weren't allowed to go to school or they were discriminated against, absolutely. But, you know, so the statement that Physics was invented and built by men. That's true. That's true. Um, but then he says it's not by invitation. So what does that mean? What does he mean here? Well, I think he means a couple things. One, I think he means that you need to choose to be in physics by yourself, right? There's some sense of self-selection here. People don't roll out the red carpet and invite you to be a phys physicist. You decide to be a physicist, right? There is agency. A, a word that feminists love to talk about is agency, right? Give, give women agency. Okay, he's saying they have agency. They're not going to get invited. They just have to decide to do it, right? Um, and I think the second thing he's saying here by there's not an invitation is he's saying that, look, success is based on merit. It's not like this old boys club where you get in or you don't, right? And he cites, this is why I think he cites Curie. He's saying, look, you come in, you do good work, you get a Nobel Prize, right? That's how it is. It's, it's merit-based. So I don't think there should be as controversial here as it seems to be, but this statement, like I said, crucified. He was crucified in the media for this. Um, and this is probably what led to his suspension from CERN.
Okay, so let's go on to slide 18. Now, uh, look, if he has, <laughs> he dug a hole with the authoritarian left on the last several slides, and especially the last slides. If he's done that, like, now he just starts drilling for oil. Uh, he, just keep, he just keeps going here. So, on this slide, he argues that there is actually discrimination against men. And he's talking more culturally now, although including in the sciences. He first makes a, a reference to someone, uh, Schwarzwild, who I don't know. He says they were killed in the World War. Maybe it's someone he knows. Um, but I think the World War uh, reference will be uh, clear why he cites that later. But he cites a few uh, examples of discriminatory uh, policy in academia, right? Um, first, he says, well, in Oxford, they have extended exam times for women. Yeah, that's discriminatory. Um, in Italy, they have free or cheaper university for female STEM students. Sounds like discrimination. Uh, in Melbourne, at Melbourne U, uh, he says that uh, STEM positions are available only for women. That sounds like discrimination, right? Um, and he goes on to claim that, look, in many places, the administration wants 50% women, irrespective of, of their merit, irrespective of whether there are 50% uh, uh, representation of women in physics. They just want to, you know, put them there. Um, and he's quote, I don't know where this quote comes from, but he's got a quote that says two to one faculty preference for women on STEM tenure track. Right. And then he goes into something, uh, less about STEM and academia and more about cultural at large. And I think this is why he's citing, um, whoever was killed, uh, Schwarzwald, who was killed in world in, in one of the world wars. Um, and he cites a UN convention, which is still valid today, which says only able-bodied, only adult able-bodied males may be called upon for forced or compulsory labor. Okay, and then he also uh, says the in Istanbul Convention, Article Four, says discriminations against men shall not be considered discrimination. So he's citing a, a broader cultural uh, example of discrimination. Two of them. Yeah, right. And then he goes, he goes on to say that the European Research Council has declared that they will give – it's their specific policy objective to achieve 40% uh, gender quotas, right? And so, again, he's, he's arguing that this is discriminatory. And, you know, what he's saying is, look, in theory, let's say that there's 10% of the, the people in physics are women, right? And let's say that – in the upper echelons of women in, in, of, of physics, it might even be more rare, but let's say it's still 10%. Well, that 40% of funds is going to go to 10%. It's, it's unfair, is his point. Um, and I think that is true if you're any kind of an individualist and not a collectivist. So, so that's his, his argument there. Then he, on slide 19, he basically has a picture of uh, an empty assembly room, and it says... First workshop on construction and gender equality. Um, and his, his, his point is that, look, there's quotas only in the best jobs, right? We don't take the worst jobs in society and make sure that there's an equal representation of women. We only look at the best jobs and make sure there's equal representation in women, uh, of, of women. And he's claiming that that's uh, discriminatory. Uh, and it is. And he makes a point that says, you know, men take the worst jobs and 95% and of workplace deaths are, are, are male deaths. So he's saying, hey, there's, there's something unequal here, right? We're, we're very worried about whether women have good jobs, but we're not really worried about uh, whether they have bad jobs <laughs> and when men get all the bad jobs. Uh, so then he goes on to slide 20 is his conclusion. He basically says, give the conservative theory a try. Maybe this mainstream theory isn't all it's cracked up to be. Now, again, just a reminder, the mainstream theory is that there's, it's gender discrimination is what's, re, uh, is what's responsible for... Um, there being a disproportionately large number of males in, in STEM fields like physics. And the conservative theory is that these gender representation differences are not due to discrimination, but they're inherent because men and women aren't actually equivalent to one another. So it's, it's not actually um, discrimination here. So he's saying, hey, he's given a lot of evidence to suggest uh, that's a counter fact, counter evidence, right? Evidence that counters the narrative of uh, the mainstream discrimination. He's saying, well, that one doesn't seem to be working. Let's take a look at the conservative theory here. How does that fit the facts, right? Because the mainstream theory doesn't fit the facts. So he goes to slide 21. <clears throat> now, 
on slide 21, he supports some, he, you know, cites some supporting evidence for why he thinks the conservative theory might be a better explanation. Now, remember the two main, um, what I was, was calling kind of the crux of that theory were that there were two things that could be contributing to, to the gender imbalance. One is interest, right? And the other is aptitude. So on this slide, he starts citing evidence that there are, is a difference, inherent difference uh, in interest between men and women. And women. So he cites some observations here uh, that men prefer working with things and women with people. Now, this has been studied. Um, there's, there's studies on this. It's pretty extensive. If you have children, uh, you already know this. Um, men tend to be more interested in engineering, science, and math, right? Um, and in fact, this is corroborated not just by that study, um, but again, if we go to the, the societies where there's more gender equality, women tend to not be going into STEM fields. Um, and, you know, there is an argument here that this, this is a social, um, that this is a, a social conditioning, right? That your, your little boy only likes trucks better than people because you gave him a truck and not a doll, right? Um, but that uh, has been has been demonstrated to be not true because these differences are actually observed in babies before there's any socialization and they're even in, observed in monkeys, right? So there's like biological evidence that, that, there's a, that there's a difference here. And frankly, from an evolutionary perspective, of course there's a difference in the brains between men and women. They have different, evolutionarily, they had different roles. It doesn't mean every woman is a certain way or every man is a certain way, but statistically you would expect a difference, right? The brain is the most expensive organ uh, from a calorie perspective, if there were no evolutionary pressures on brain differentiation, it would just make no sense, right? Um, so you'd expect this. This isn't surprising. So he says, hey, look, it may be that women aren't as interested in this, right? Um, maybe we should assume that women know what they want and don't need to be forced into STEM fields. Um, and he says, you know, maybe there's an explanation for this. <clears throat> and he says, this explanation, look, it might not be completely right, but... Um, we know that uh, you know the the assumption that brains are identical is is just based on ideology. There's no science behind that. That's just because you want it to be true, right? So we here's a theory. He says, um, look, you know your your brain. Um, there's the kind of this uh, empathizing versus systematization. Uh, um, sort of mindset or configuration of your brain, and maybe that's influenced by the amount of prenatal testosterone you get. Um, and he didn't just, you know, make that up. Uh, I invite you, you know, this is not just his theory. We know that go uh, that um, that hormones affect brain development uh, in utero. Go Google testosterone prenatal brain development. You'll find lots of articles about uh, how testosterone affects prenatal brain development. I'm sure uh, other hormones do as well. That's just the one that he's um, mentioning and uh, that I know about as well. So he says, hey, there's a theory here. In fact, then he says, he doesn't say we should take this theory as fact because it supports my position, which is what the other side is saying, right? They're saying take as fact that men and women are exactly the same. Um, he's saying, well, maybe this theory is not right, but I have a way to test it. He proposes a way to test it. What a scientist, right? He says, oh, well, here's a way. We could measure, we could take um, female physicists and measure uh, secondary traits in their brains, like what he calls the, the 2D to 4D digit ratio, right? But he's, he's talking about like um, geospatial reasoning and, and actually also um, um, the, the, the propensity to like, you know, ob again, objects over people, right? It's this uh, empathizing versus systematization of the brain. Maybe if you, you know, he's proposing, look, maybe if we examine the female physicists, it will turn out that their brain configurations are actually more similar to other male physicists. And if we take um, females who are in maybe uh, humanities or people-oriented fields, maybe their brains will look more like the men who are also in those fields. It's a way to test it. Great idea. I don't know if anyone's done it. Probably no one will because no one wants to talk about this, but he proposes a way to test it. So if anyone was serious about uh, actually discrediting him, they would go ahead and test. So the next slide, uh, you know, at this point, he's made the case that men and women have different interests, and he drives this point home with a kind of a funny cartoon uh, about gender imbalance in the STEM fields. If you're on video, you can just look at the cartoon, but 
for those of you who are only listening, I'll quickly explain it. There's uh, <clears throat> three women um, standing in front of a couple booths, maybe at a, at a job fair or something like that. And one of the booths says STEM fields, sign up. And the other booth says gender studies, sign up. And, uh, and both of the people occupying the booths are looking over at the women, hoping that they come over and sign up for their respective uh, fields. And in the next frame, all the women go and sign up for the gender studies at the gender studies booth, and the STEM guy is kind of scratching his head, wondering why they didn't come over. Um, and then in the last frame, the three women who had uh, signed up at the gender studies booth are now all holding signs. Uh, one says, more women in STEM, science is sexist, STEM is boys club, uh, and they're protesting. And of course, the, the guy in the STEM field booth is shrugging his hands, shrug, shrugging his shoulders like, I don't know, what can you do? Right um, now, it's a funny cartoon, but he's, it's a real, it's a real point. Um, you know, there are a lot of people protesting women in STEM who aren't, who are women who aren't in STEM. So the idea that we need to force, you know, I have a daughter. The idea that I need to force her into STEM to uh, just to make some, you know gender studies professor happy about the ratio is ridiculous. She has agency. If she wants to do math, she'll do math. If she wants to do, you know, literature, that's what she'll do. Um, that's called uh, actually respecting women and having agency. But of course, um, all these women who claim that there's this bias don't bother to even go into STEM themselves. Obviously, some women in STEM do claim there's a bias, but in general, it seems like, seems like it's the ones that major in gender studies. So that's the point of this slide. So then... So now he goes to, let's go to slide 23. Now this one, this is probably the most controversial subject to talk about. Um, I don't even remember if James Damore talked about this uh, at all, but uh, it's, I, my understanding is what, what I'm about to say, I don't think it's controversial from a, a facts standpoint. It's just, you're not allowed to talk about it. So remember um, the two factors he's suggesting in, in the, quote, conservative theory, the two factors he's suggesting that may contribute to gender imbalances in the scientists, sciences. Um, one of those factors was interest, and he talked about the interest um, of, of men versus women in brain configurations in which they, which they tend to like, um, you know, whether they tend to like objects or people, and therefore engineering or humanities. In this slide, he talks about aptitude. Now, that's a can of worms and... and, and uh, a subject that you want to get uh, you want to get vilified for bring up bring up IQ and this is what he's talking about now again I don't think this is controversial from a scientific perspective the science isn't really disputed here but we just we've just all agreed to never talk about it so his point here there's there's some math here I won't I won't get into it uh, the math too much but I'll, I'll give you an overview of the point <clears throat> the point here is that um, both men and women uh, statistically uh, fall on a bell curve distribution in terms of IQ. So there's some people who are at the really low end of IQ and some people who are at the really high end of IQ and a bunch of people who are grouped in the middle. And that's true for both men and women. And I think the averages are about the same for both. So um, not a lot of difference between the two genders there. However, there is a difference in the shape of the curves. Um, women's curves seems to be, women's bell curve seems to be more um, spiky right? Um, Stefan Molyneux actually calls it like, it's shaped like a penis. The, the women's curve is shaped like a penis and the guy's is shaped like a, a breast, right? That's his, his description. It's not quite that exaggerated, but, but basically the, the distribution is more centered around the mean for women and less centered around the mean for men. It's more distributed for men. And <clears throat> what this means is that you have, um, if you look in the middle, there's basically not much of a difference, but as you go out to the ends, right? As you go out to the lower end and the higher end, the, the female graph drops off more quickly, and the male graph has longer tails at both ends. And what that means is that there are more men who are uh, dumber on the dumber end. So if you're going to look at uh, people with really low IQ, um, really, really struggling functionally, they tend to be men, right? Because there are more men represented because the bell curve is flatter for men. There's more men represented at that end. Similarly, and of course, uh, no feminists would, would mind that statement. Similarly, at the other end of the graph, um, at the very highest levels of IQ, there tend to be more men, right? Because it tapers off more gradually at the high end as well. So it's 
ba- we're back to my analogy of uh, one group getting B's all the time and one group getting C's and A's, right? Obviously, that's exaggerated, but if you think about those two groups, they may have the same average, but if you're only going to look at the top or only going to look at the bottom, you're going to see an overrepresentation of one of those groups. And that's his argument here, all right? He's saying, look, uh, if we're looking at on the top ends of physics, right, physics already is selective, and then, you know, the highest ends, the most... Uh, prominent physicists, the, the Nobel laureates, they're going to be disproportionately male simply because of how the math works out here uh, from a statistics standpoint. Now, just to be, just to be really clear on this, um, this is statistics, and a lot of people have trouble telling the difference between statistics and individual um, claims, right? These statistics tell you no information about a particular individual. You can't see a guy and know he's smarter than some woman, right? Or dumber than some woman. It doesn't mean that some woman can't be the smartest person on the planet or the dumbest person on the planet. It just means on average, statistically, if you're looking at groups of people, these are the trends you're going to start to see. So you can't judge any individuals based on this. But um, if you're looking at statistics, which the, the people worried about gender discrimination are, they're looking at statistics, they're looking at distributions, then you have to take this into account. So he says, look, this fits well, right? And it might explain this phenomenon of gender differences. But, and this is what he says, but, and then he goes to the next slide, and he shows slide 24. He excites, he cites examples of basically people getting fired for saying this and talking about it. As I said, it's it's not something that we're, we're supposed to talk about. Um, now, he says that uh, Larry Summers was fired from Harvard for saying this. I'm actually not sure that's true. He was certainly vilified in the press for saying this. Uh, there's a rumor that he was fired for some other stuff, but it doesn't matter. Um, plenty, plenty of people were um, fired or had their careers ruined or certainly harassed um, in the mainstream media. Uh, James Damore, he cites, as someone fired fired by Google um, for for talking about this kind of stuff. So, um, so he's saying, look, this fits the theory, but we can't talk about it um, because uh, we'll get fired. And... Um, he also he also makes a weird claim that CERN was CERN was attacked as being homophobic in the media homophobic in the media in 2016. He says for nothing, um, but uh, I think there actually was a researcher that was uh, defacing posters of LBGTQ uh, meetings. So anyway, that aside, he's talking about this general. Uh, the guy's clearly conservative, right? So he's but he's talking about this general um, problem that you can't talk about these things, and you can't even talk about them to the point where someone can like have a rational discussion and disprove you. I would love for this to be wrong. Maybe it's wrong, but we can't even talk about it because we're not allowed to bring it up and have anyone even uh, have a, a sane discussion about it. You just get vilified for being a, a misogynist, and you get fired from Google. So he says, "Look, why? Who's behind this? Why are we getting fired? Why? Why can't we talk about this?" And he offers his theory. So on slide 25, he says, well, his theory is that it's cultural Marxism. And he basically blames uh, politicians. And he says they're, they're promoting victimocracy. And their goal is to ideologically indoctrinate people. Um, and science is kind of standing in their way. And that's, that's the reason. Now, I think he's wrong on this. Uh, I don't think the reason is politics. Um, politics is downstream from culture. But culture is downstream from philosophy. Um, if you're interested in what I think are more uh, is a more accurate, uh, rigorous uh, examination of the roots behind this kind of uh, this kind of culture, uh, I would invite you to read um, Explaining Postmodernism by Stephen Hicks. Uh, I'll put an, a link to the book on Amazon in, in the show notes. It's a great book. He does an excellent job uh, of explaining um, how we kind of got to where we are today culturally and really pulling the curtain back on what's going on and has been going on in academia uh, in the humanities for quite some time. So anyway, at the end of this slide, um, at the end of this slide, uh, Strumia um, says, look, you know, he kind of almost jokes, I, I said a thought crime, according to the Minister of Truth and the PC Thought Police. So he's kind of like, hey, I committed a thought crime, ha, ha, ha. And, and, then, um, and then he goes to the last slide, which is conclusions. And his, his conclusion is, obviously, look. The data is not consistent with this this mainstream model of discrimination. It, it just isn't consistent, right? Instead, 
the data is consistent with the more conservative model, right? And his conclusion is that physics is not discriminatory against women. Um, but then he says, well, you know, but truth doesn't matter because uh, there's a political battle here and I don't know who's going to win. And then, you know, he ends with what I think is probably the most tragic remark in this entire presentation, um, which he says, P.S., many people told me, don't speak, it's dangerous, right? So they're saying, don't speak about this, it's dangerous. Um, and then he, he kind of jokes and he says, well, as a student, I wrote that uh, weak scale supersymmetry is not right. It's a physics joke. Uh, I wrote that weak scale supersymmetry is not right and I survived, right? So he's kind of joking like, ah, you know, I've said things that are controversial before, I'll be fine, right? He thought he would survive. Uh, and clearly, um, he didn't survive completely. He may, we don't know, maybe he'll get fired, but he's at least suspended now for bringing this up. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, I know it was a little bit long, but I think uh, I think he did an excellent job on, you know, the English isn't great and, and uh, it's hard to follow the slides uh, if you didn't hear uh, the presentation, which I, I didn't. I'm just uh, guessing as I'm reading these slides. But uh, I, I did think it was something, you know, it's a, it's a great argument, great, uh, great set of slides. And so I wanted to wanted to walk you through it. And I hope you guys found it helpful, men and women both. Um, it's, uh, it's a real problem. And it's, we're going to continue to fire people like, uh, like James Damore, and, uh, and people like Alessandro Strumia, if we don't, if we don't do something to change the culture and, and really have the guts to talk about difficult subjects. And this, you know, it is a difficult subject. So anyway, thank you for watching. Um, please follow on Twitter. We're Unsafe Show on Twitter. Please go ahead and like, subscribe, share, anything you can do to help out. The show is just starting. So any kind of sharing, um, subscriptions, uh, I'd love it. Really appreciate it. You can go to unsafeshow.com slash subscribe. There's a bunch of ways to consume the show, including podcasts, YouTube, that kind of thing. Um, you can also support the show. You can go to patreon.com slash unsafe space. Or you can just uh, go to the URL I mentioned, unsafeshow.com, and you can support us with cryptocurrency. Uh, but really, please just like, follow, share. That's the best thing you can do for us right now. So thanks so much, and I will talk to you again. Unfortunately, we're probably going to have to talk about Brett Kavanaugh again this week. So take care, everyone.